My name is Ivan Pavlov and uh, I'm a backend developer in DevExperts and I'm, I have more than four years of experience and most of my career I've been working in DevExperts and I participated in three projects actually in DevExperts and all of them were very different with different technologies and different, different ideas behind these projects. And I also a, a Kotlin enthusiast and I promoted Kotlin in all of my projects with different level of support. And I contributed to Spring Security Repository improving Kotlin DSL there. Let me briefly talk about the backend department I'm working in. So we have approximately 170 backend engineers. They are spread across approximately 15 units. So this is not a single team. There are a lot of teams. And our primary languages for development are Java and C Sharp. Uh, the company is working on multiple projects in fintech field. Uh, you can see um, different types of projects we have. Like we're working on uh, multi-asset trading platforms which integrates with brokers portal, compliance systems, uh, exchange gateway, gateways, and so on. We also work on Forex and CFDs platforms which integrates with brokers ecosystems like CRM, um, liquidity, and so on. Of course, we are working with cryptocurrency trading platforms and provide uh, solutions for trading with uh, digital assets. And we also build um, fully full exchange solutions for stocks, uh, futures options, and cryptocurrencies. And this, pro uh, this uh, project list is not completed. We have a lot of different projects. And let me talk about my project. I'm working on LiveBash, and this is an innovative project. Uh, let me briefly describe what this project is about. So the real person, an artist, will come to a real studio to perform there and uh, will be recording a live stream and broadcast this to users. But the key point is that our solution is built on top of Ethereum blockchain. So we will be trading some digital assets right in this uh, application. Let's just take a look at the one screen and I will talk briefly about it, that and then we go deeper to technical details. On the top of the page, you can see the video player. The users will be able to watch the live stream and the system will generate uh, NFTs for this performance and user will, will be able to buy it on NFT auction. You can see trading controls on the bottom of the screen. And also this full performance video can be cut into smaller episodes and the system will generate uh, multiple token copies for each of these episodes. And users will be able to buy some tokens and resell it later. If the user doesn't have any tokens for some episode, he won't be able to rewatch it again. You can see it uh, in the middle left on the page. Blurred image means that uh, the user won't be able to watch it. Okay, but we're here for technical details. So let's go to what we had at the beginning. Our application was started as monolithic app written in Java 11 and Spring. Uh, I already told that uh, we have Ethereum blockchain integration, so we use Solidity programming language. Uh, as a data storage, we picked PostgreSQL we packed our applications into Docker images and deploy them on AWS. But we don't want to stuck with the technologies uh, we picked at the beginning. We want to evolve. So the first thing we added was Kotlin. I promoted it, of course. Uh, so we decided to write only tests in Kotlin because I never pushed people too hard with Kotlin and don't make them write everything in this language. 
Later, we realized that we can also switch to the latest long-term support uh, release for Java, which was 17 at that point. And it brings a lot of uh, improvements into the language itself and into the standard library. OK, I demonstrated to you that uh, we have a lot of media on our application. So what did we pick to process this media? Of course, we are on AWS, and AWS provides a lot of services which are useful for that. For example, Media Life and some other services, and they allow us to create these uh, videos, cut them into smaller pieces, and so on and so forth. But how to integrate? We use AWS Lambdas because they can be triggered by these AWS events other services provide. And uh, this Lambda can communicate with our application then. But these Lambdas can be written in different languages. And uh, all of them have some uh, advantages and disadvantages. The two options we were considering of was, uh, were Python and Java. So let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of both of them. So the main advantage is, of Java is, of course, that we are familiar with Java. We are Java team, so we would uh, be able to write code easily. It also would be possible to share our models between our Lambda applications and our like, main application. Uh, and it would simplify development process and future maintenance. And uh, Java Lambdas have uh, relatively less time uh, of processing requests than Python Lambdas. So this is another advantage. On the other hand, the documentation of AWS SDK is not so good. You probably won't be able to find a lot of examples for not so popular services like media ones. And Java Lambdas also have slow called startup time uh, because it needs to start up a Java virtual machine. And uh, you as a customer uh, will be billable for that. So all the time that is spent for startup, you will see it in AWS bills. And what can Python offer us? The first thing is that both the three library is uh, really great. It has comprehensive documentation. You can find any example for any service AWS have. It also has faster cold startup time because it doesn't require to start up a virtual machine. And Python is a good language for writing simple codes. But we are not Java. Uh, we are not Python developers, so we are not proficient in this language, and most of us are not even familiar with it. So this is definitely a very big disadvantage of this choice. And actual processing is a bit slower than in Java because just runtime of Python is a bit slower. Um, so. Actually, we chose Python, and the key factor was this documentation of both of three library. So even if developer is not familiar with Python, he's still able to just copy paste examples and do small changes in the code, and it will be working just fine. So yeah, we have Python in our repository. OK, uh, this is the hardest topic for us and uh, the biggest pain in the neck. So our requirement was to build our solution on top of Ethereum blockchain. And we needed to investigate a lot of things and research. And the first thing, of course, was uh, the language for smart contracts. But there are not too many options here, so we just 
go with went with Solidity programming language, which is built just for that, for writing smart contracts. But how to integrate these smart contracts with Java? How to call something from your Java code and stuff like that? So there is Web3J library which can uh, help us with that. With that, it can compile uh, your Solidity contracts into binary code and then convert it to Java classes. But actually, the Gradle plugin for Web3J didn't work for the recent version of Gradle, and we couldn't just use it. So we had to build our solution differently. We had to somehow change the process. So we had to use um, Hardhead framework, which is actually a JavaScript framework, and uh, it uh, has comprehensive documentation, and you can just copy paste uh, some code, and it will it will just work. And this Hardhead module compiles our Solidity contracts into Truffle JSON file, which we can after that with the help of Gradle task, pass to Web3J converter, which can generate actual Java classes. So you can see the process here is not simple, and it was a tough task to just establish the process. And I'm not even speaking with the blockchain stuff itself. OK, the database. You may even wonder why do I have this slide with database because Postgres is a great tool. It even has uh, support of JSON storing. But there are multiple factors that can make you rethink that you need to use Postgres. For example, we are on AWS and we care about the infrastructure cost and the infrastructure itself. So for PostgreSQL, you have to pick up appropriate instance, and you can't even um, predict, let's say, predict your prices with this instance. And if it doesn't fit you, you'll have to somehow change it, and this will also be a pain. The next point is maintenance and configuration issues. So it's a relational database, and maybe defaults are good, but it often requires uh, like manual configuration, and if your load is unpredictable, uh, you may need to do some tuning of your database or uh, some stuff like that. On AWS, there is another solu solution, which is called DynamoDB, and it is NoSQL database. Uh, actually, it's key value storage with some advanced features. And it eliminates uh, problems I mentioned, because it scales almost indefinitely regardless of your database size. So you don't need to think about it at all. And it's also easy to set up and configure. Uh, there are not so many options there. And uh, performance is really stable. So. Yeah, we're using DynamoDB now, and I can say that like, we're happy with that. There are some problems, but we're working on it and trying to find the best approaches. OK. Uh, distributed systems are not uh, surprising nowadays. So you probably already heard about these uh, comparisons, monolith versus distributed system. So I won't repeat all stuff over and over again. I just mentioned some points which affected our decision. So the first thing is that we are on AWS. And if we need some scaling, it's not so easy to add resources. We have to like pick up uh, the more powerful uh, instance for that. Or we have to duplicate the whole application which is really inefficient because uh, it's like doubling your resources consumption. 
On the other hand, distributed systems gives us, uh, give us flexibility because we can develop and scale our application independently for different parts of it. And another thing is that when you like thinking about moving from monolith to distributed system, you have to think about messaging between your services. And sometimes it's like the hardest thing. Uh, but in our case, we already had AWS lambdas. So we actually already had some sort of distributed system. And uh, this communication between AWS Lambda and uh, our application was already established. So infrastructure was ready um, and we decided that distributed approach is more appropriate for us. So we just migrate to this uh, step by step. Okay, I can talk about the project and technologies uh, indefinitely, but uh, organizers told me that if I don't fit time slot, they won't get me my passport back. So, yeah, uh, there are a lot of topics I haven't covered. For example, what is our CI CD pipeline? How are we actually deploying to AWS? And our team processes, what is, uh, which roles our team has, how we work, and so on and so forth. Why didn't I use microservice term in my speech? I explicitly used distributed systems instead of it. And are, are our developers are really happy with Kotlin or maybe most of them want to go back with full Java and rewrite all tests in our application back to Java. And of course, there are a lot of problems with DynamoDB and it's completely different mindset. Uh, for example, maybe some of you heard of a single table design. So actually, uh, our application has a single table for most of stuff. Thank you.